Please join me in in prayer. Holy Spirit, as we hear the story of the feeding of the 5,000, we gather before you in this place, some of us in fragments, some fragmented from people in our lives. And so we ask you, as we turn our hearts and our lives to you, to gather up the fragments and to show us the abundance that is here. Amen. So following on last week, we once again have a story of Jesus trying to get away from the crowds that are following him. Um, Because he's offering things that are priceless. He's offering healing. He's offering wisdom, meaning. He's offering exorcisms of the demons that plague people. And so he keeps moving farther and farther away from civilization, up into the hills, up into the mountains, across the lake, And whenever he looks up, there's this crowd just kind of following him. And so the crowd gathers and comes to a flat place up in the hills. And we have the feeding of the 5,000, a familiar story of Jesus, a familiar miracle. And they say, as he's able to share with them the Passover feast, turning a few loaves and a couple fish into food for 5,000 people, they say to themselves, surely this is the prophet that we were promised, who will proclaim the kingdom of God, maybe anoint for us a new king in the line of David. And then Jesus realizes that things are escalating, and that the crowd, it says, is going to come and take him by force, seize him, and try to force him to be king. And so for him, that is the last straw, and he leaves. Kind of flees up the mountain by himself, finally escaping the crowd. Following this, we kind of picture the crowd dispersing. Well, we tried to grab him, we tried to make him king, we can't find him. I guess we'll disperse back to our homes with an incredible story to share. And the disciples go and they get into a boat and they're crossing the Sea of Galilee. And we have the shorter version of the story of Jesus walking on water. Kind of walking past them. Like waving as he goes. But for this sermon... I want to focus on the first story and on the reading from Ephesians, and I want to focus on the theme of power. Reading the passage in Ephesians, uh, it's about a lot of things. Like, I was just struck by a fully formed idea for an entirely different sermon, and I had to, like, concentrate to set it aside to focus on this. I think I'll do that other sermon for the perspective, probably. So... We'll see how that goes, because it should go somewhere, but not this morning. I'm confused enough. But the reading in Ephesians is, among many other things, about power. It begins with bowing before God alone. It talks about the power that is within us. And by the end of this little section that we read, it is power that is able to accomplish more than we can imagine or more than we can even dream. And so I had power on my mind, I guess, different kinds of power as I was reflecting on these readings. It reminded me of, um, I have a number of favorite Tolkien quotes, but there's one from his letters that is a favorite of mine. And I read it as it was originally written, with apologies. It was written in the 1940s. The most improper job of any man, even saints, 
is bossing other men. Not one in a million is fit for it, and least of all those who seek the opportunity. This sums up my views pretty well, although I think that one in a million is optimistic. Power over other people, authority over other people, is something that humans desperately seek. It is one of the things that we are reliably willing to kill for, to seize by force, to gain through threats and manipulation. It's also a kind of power, the power over other people, that Christ never uses. In fact, when he's offered that kind of power, albeit by Satan, he refuses. And I think there's something about that kind of power, power over other people. The power to force people to do what you want, that is in itself satanic. When Christians have power over other people, when we gain power to force people to do what we want, it is the worst thing to happen to our faith. It began relatively early, but really hit us when the Roman Empire converted to Christianity. And suddenly, we are the ones who can nail people to crosses. And we are the ones with armies that can conquer. And we are the ones with military parades through the streets and banners and swords and spears and shields. And I think at that point, we became infected with the disease of power. And I think you can draw a relatively straight line from Roman imperialism to European imperialism to Christian nationalism today. This infection in Christianity where some of us continually seek power over other people or want people to wield power over others on our behalf. To say yes to Satan's offer where Jesus said no. In Ephesians, we read about God's power that is at work within us. Not over us, not over others, but within. And that this power is able to accomplish more than we can ask or even imagine. But it is clearly, I think, a different kind of power than the one we usually seek or the one that we see wielded around us or the kind of power that's wielded most often maybe over us. Jesus is continually moved by the needs of the people around him. Like even when the text tells us he wants to get out, he's, he's full, he's done, he's frustrated, he's exhausted, he's spent, He tries to leave, and then as in our reading last week, people come and find him, and he's like, oh, okay. He sees that they're like sheep without a shepherd, and he just has compassion for them, and so he takes a deep breath and goes back in to continue to serve. And he gives of himself, and he remains present for people who are in need until the thing they need is a king. He offers himself to them until what they want to offer him is power. And then he leaves. I watched and listened to a sermon of a colleague, and I think that he fell into a temptation Because as a preacher, you want to feel like you're speaking truth to power, 
right? And so I think he felt like he was doing that. He was very passionate, very eloquent. And I think that he forgot that the people in the room that he was talking to are not power brokers in the world. It's just a regular congregation. It looks, I saw it on video, it looks a lot like our congregation. And I know that there are not power brokers here. I know that when I talk about seeking power over other people, many of us don't have that. We might not even actively seek it. Politics is something that we watch rather than something that we do. For the most part, I think, from what I know of this room. Still, there are ways that we seek power and to use power in our own scale, in our individual life, locally, interpersonally. We can be passive aggressive or sometimes aggressive-aggressive when we want to get people to do things we want them to do. Or when we feel like our needs aren't being met, we find a way. Or we come to understand that we experience privilege and we just kind of like, let's let it happen. Like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to fight. I'm just going to let this work itself out. Not going to resist. Or maybe we, we come on a Sunday and we're hoping primarily to be fed rather than being equipped to feed others. Or maybe we do things that are charitable. Like we help people who are hungry, we help the homeless, but we hesitate to ask, like, why are they hungry? Why are they homeless? And sometimes, I don't know about you, there's a part of me that kind of takes some comfort in the fact that I'm the one who's giving. I have what someone else needs. That feels good. And it's not wrong to give to people in need, but it also can be a kind of power. I think that as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are at our best. We are at our strongest when we're not bossing, when we're not trying to make other people do what we want, but rather when we are moved from within. More similar to the way that Jesus is moved from within. In a conversation earlier this week, I said something off the cuff that kind of defined what I thought my message was this morning. I kind of built this sermon around. I said something like, Jesus walks through a storm, unmoved. Jesus doesn't run away from being arrested. He doesn't run away from being tortured. He doesn't run away from being killed. Jesus runs away from power. They want to make him a king, and he's gone. The one who is otherwise present for everything. I found that really striking. So different from the way we often are. Thinking about it, I thought maybe it isn't that we're meant to be powerless, but we're meant to have a wholly other kind of power. Something that you don't see in history books very often, something you don't see in politics, something you don't see at work. 
Not power over other people, but a power within us. Which allows us to continually be able to be moved from within. Like Christ was moved from within. And to know when and how we are to move. I think that reading Ephesians as a follower of Jesus... My hope is that all the power that we need, we already have. There's no power we need to seek. There's no power we need to grasp or take. There's no one we have to find who will wield power on our behalf over other people. And if we have already the power that we need, then the question is, Are we willing to use it? Or maybe a better way of asking that question is, are we willing to let God use us? Amen.